In the darkness of Good Friday, they watched as Jesus hanged on the cross outside the city of Jerusalem. There was no need for them now to hurry in the early hours of that first Easter morning. Jesus had not simply suffered a setback at the hands of the Roman soldiers. He was dead. They had witnessed it all, the nailing, the beating, and the torturing that occurred. It wasn't a pretty sight. And they had to turn away at the whipping and finally the crucifixion. Finally, he breathed his last. Just to make sure that he was really dead, a soldier took a spear and stuck it into the side of Jesus. He was dead. So they took him down from the cross and they laid him in that tomb. His mark from the nails remained in his hands and his side also bore visibly that slash of the spear. Jesus was dead. But in the rush of the Sabbath, not everything had been properly taken care of. And so the women went to the tomb on that first Easter morning to complete his burial properly. But what did they discover? They went to prepare Jesus' body for burial, but then they began to wonder just exactly what they could accomplish because the tomb had a large stone that had been rolled in front of it. Approaching the burial site, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, removed from the entrance. Mark's gospel shares with us that the stone was very large, but it had been rolled aside. He is not here. Jesus, the one you are looking for, he is risen. He goes before you, proclaimed the angel. Risen from the dead, Jesus Christ could have been the superstar for all of his generation. All he needed was a tour promoter, and he could have sold out stadium after stadium all the way to Rome. But what happens after that first Easter morning? Does Jesus go on a nationwide, a worldwide tour promoting his resurrection from the dead, promoting the message of God's kingdom? The story, the story of Easter continues today with the gospel reading from St. John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. Scripture records no appearances after his resurrection except to those who believed in him. For 40 days, Jesus visits with various groups of disciples. He visits Mary Magdalene at the tomb on Easter morning. He visits those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He drops in on this group of disciples that we hear about in John chapter 20, but Thomas is not with them, so Jesus returns a little bit later. Again, to all of these disciples, but this time Thomas is there with them. He appears to his disciples again on the Mount of Olives, on his Ascension Day. All Jesus' resurrection appearances are made to those who have known him. Beside that, we have no witness at all. He needed to teach his own. But why is it that Jesus appears only to his disciples? That Jesus does not take the time to appear to others. He could have been such a hero. But no, you see, there are more stones that need to be rolled away. More than just that stone that was in front of the tomb where Jesus was buried. It's not the only stone 
that needs to be rolled away. Because disciples also have stones that need to be rolled away. So that Jesus, by his appearance, rolls many of the stones away, many more stones away for disciples who lived at that time, but also for disciples who lived today. So our first note this morning reminds us that Jesus' presence drives away fear. The cross frightened Jesus' disciples. The cross still frightens people today. On the evening of that first day of the week, says John 20, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. It is Easter evening, and the disciples have gathered together. Perhaps it is still the same room in which they had celebrated the Passover just a few days earlier. But they are together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. One of the Christian concerts my wife and I enjoyed last year at Banker's Life Fieldhouse was Casting Crown. One of their guests was Zach Williams. I enjoy his song, Fear is a Liar, because of the truth that it speaks to the words of that song. When he told you you're not good enough. When he told you you're not right. When he told you you're not strong enough to put up a good fight. When he told you you're not worthy. When he told you you're not loved. When he told you you're not beautiful, that you'll never be enough. Fear, he is a liar. Jesus' presence drives away fear. Note what all happens. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. Jesus comes into their presence, into their midst, with his very own presence. He stands there among them. They are hiding. They've locked the door. They're afraid of the Jewish leaders. Maybe they are next after all. But Jesus still comes and he stands in their midst. We cannot hide from his presence. And that's a good thing because even in our fear, even in our struggles, even in those times when grief and sorrow weigh heavy upon us, driving all other thoughts from our hearts and our minds, Jesus is still there present among us and present with us and in us. Then Jesus speaks to them, peace be with you. That's just what the angel said to the women in Matthew 28, do not be afraid, the angel said early that Easter morning, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. Now Jesus speaks the very same word to this group of disciples. Peace be with you. <laughs> he speaks that same good word to you also. You may be one of the many anxious people trying to work through all of the uncertainties and the changes and all of the questions of this COVID-19 pandemic. Those questions continue to abound. When is this going to end? When can I go back to my office? When can I get back to my business? When can I go out to my favorite restaurant again? Why doesn't this just all go away so that we can resume living normal again. Again today, the living 
and the risen Lord Jesus Christ says to us all, peace be with you. Do me a favor, friend. Share those words with one another. Share it with a family member. Share it with a neighbor, with a colleague. Peace be with you. The peace of the Lord holds us, calms us, surrounds us, and keeps us. Then Jesus showed them his hands and his side. These are the marks of the crucified Jesus. But he is not dead. He is risen, and his hands and his side tell us that this is not fake news. This is really Jesus. Our fears flee in the presence of the risen Jesus. Our fears flee, and what replaces them? That's our second note this morning. Our Easter response, joy. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And we too are overjoyed when we see the Lord. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He speaks his peace to us. And we share his peace as Christ's people with one another. He shows us his scars, his body broken for us, and his blood shed for us as he reminds us just how great is his love for us. He is now risen, and his love is no less than it ever was. Love for sinners, love by which Jesus saves us, rescues us from all of our fears, and speaks to us again and again and again, peace be with you. Joy replaces fear. But joy is not all that results from Jesus' Easter appearance. The risen Jesus gives to his disciples a job. John tells us again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. I I'm sending you, says Jesus. Disciples are sent people. Right now, we are sent to those in our homes, as that's where we are supposed to be staying most of the time. Sent does not always mean that disciples have to go halfway around the world. Rather, sent means that there is more than enough of work for us as his disciples to do right here, in our homes, in our communities, sharing the love of Christ right where we live to those who are closest to us, those in our homes, in our neighborhoods, and in our community. I am sending you. Christ's resurrection means that his victory over sin and death and the devil is now the victory that is shared by all those who trust and believe in him. In him, ours is a new life. And all of the disciples of Jesus are involved in this new life. All of us engaged one way or another in the ministry of Jesus that extends out. Jesus does not intend his disciples to stay locked up in a room. And Jesus does not intend his disciples to stay locked up in a church building either. I am sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. His Spirit enables the ministry of Jesus Christ and that which is at the center of that ministry, and that's the forgiveness of sins, to be freely shared with one another as God, through Christ, has freely shared it with us. But the disciple Thomas was absent when Jesus first appears. The risen Lord comes to his disciples, but there is one disciple who, for whatever reason, is not there. 
perhaps his stay-at-home order extended to a different place. We do know he is practicing social distancing. Unfortunately, though, in the, this story, that does not work in his favor. So the other disciples tell Thomas, says the Gospel of John's story, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them, though the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. He said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out with your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Our third note, Thomas doubts and demands. And that's what we call him. Isn't it doubting Thomas? Unless I see, I will not believe. Thomas is not willing to take the word of his closest friends, his fellow disciples. We don't know where Thomas was, but he certainly missed a great deal by not being with those fellow disciples. He missed a lot by being absent. It's a reminder to all of us that when we separate ourselves from our fellow disciples, we also miss a great deal. I suspect we in the church have all come to realize just a little bit more that we need that encouragement from each other, that we need the mutual support that we receive from the fellowship of God's people. We cannot yet gather together with one another, but we can continue, we can continue to encourage one another, to build one another up in the love by which Christ loves us and gave himself up for us. As Jesus receives word of his friend Lazarus' illness, his disciples are concerned for Jesus' safety. A short while ago, they tried to stone you, they remind Jesus. But though Lazarus has died, Jesus gathers together his disciples so that they might go to Bethany. And it's Thomas who at that point says, let us also go that we may die with him. So Thomas is no coward. And though he was absent from this group of disciples on the evening of that first Easter, Thomas comes back. He joins them once again. He does not cut himself off permanently from the company of the disciples. He does not accept their witness, but he is present with them. If you know of a disciple who has separated themselves, been absent for a while, encourage them to return, Invite them again once more to connect with Jesus. Share this broadcast with them as you are encouraged by our worship as we gather this day, as you are strengthened by God's word. So encourage them also to tune in and worship with us. Remember, Remember that on that first Easter morning when the women come back to this group of disciples telling them that Jesus is risen, what did they think? Scripture tells us that they did not listen to the women because they thought it was so much nonsense. They all are really like Thomas. And so Jesus returns to connect a second time with all of his disciples. This time, Thomas is there with them. A second time, they experience the joy of Easter. Jesus says again, peace be with you. And then he says directly to the disciple Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Thomas doesn't do that, but he does say, my Lord and my God. Thomas reminds us that 
It's all right to have misgivings, even serious misgivings. Thomas makes demands that he really has no right at all to make, but we are glad that he did because he ends up making this beautiful confession of faith. He doesn't take Jesus up on his offer to touch. He doesn't put his finger, he doesn't reach out to Jesus' side. He does, though, believe. And that's our final note today. Easter's new life comes as we believe. Thomas is a constant reminder that our problems are always problems of faith. So Jesus continues to come to us. We too struggle with our fears. Numerous fears from within, sometimes fears from without. We too at times hide our faith in Jesus behind closed doors. No one sees that faith. No one knows that we are Jesus' disciples. For these disciples, seeing was believing. But even then, even then it was difficult to convince those disciples. So Jesus comes for 40 days again and again to them, convincing people is not an easy thing to do. Last week, as we talked about the tomb of Jesus, I mentioned that drive west from this central Indiana area, and in a couple hours, you can, in Springfield, Illinois, you can go visit the tomb of Abraham Lincoln. Well, you can drive a shorter distance to the east, and you will visit the home and the shop of the Wright brothers. Orville and Wilbur Wright flew their flying machine right outside the city of Dayton, Ohio. But few believed those reports, and no newspaper reported on those events at that time at all. The Wright brothers were flying their airplanes overseas for several years before anyone in the United States invited them to demonstrate their invention and its uses here. We struggle with doubt, just as Thomas did, just as all of the disciples did. To live by faith is not easy. But Jesus tells them, as Jesus tells us, blessed are those who have not seen, but yet still believe. We walk at times. And that faith wavers. We walk at times with a lack of faith and trust in our risen Lord. We need Jesus' assurance, his blessed assurance. In his word and by his sacraments, Jesus continues to appear to us, convincing us of the new life that he brings to his disciples each and every day. We are his forgiven people. We are alive with a new faith in Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in vain because Christ is risen. Death and the cemetery and this virus do not have the final word. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, so that by the power of Christ's Spirit working in us, we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and believing we have life in his name. Though you have not seen him, says St. Peter, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. As his Easter people, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we live this week again with that inexpressible and glorious joy. For Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.